Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Whitaker, trauma specialist, and I wanted to start off 2023 um, with a concept that I've referred to in some of my other videos, um, especially when I talked about boundaries. Um, but maybe you've heard me talk about window of tolerance. Um, and sometimes I use the language resilient zone or okay zone. Um, the window of tolerance is a concept um, that was originally developed by Dr. Dan Siegel. And I am a certified trainer for the community resiliency model. And so in the community resiliency model, the language that we use for window of tolerance is called resilient zone or okay zone. So I just wanted to let you know up front that all three of those terms are used interchangeably. And I have a couple slides put together. So I'm going to take just a moment and share my screen and get this slideshow started. And let's talk about the window of tolerance. So the window of tolerance, like I said, is a concept originally developed by Dr. Dan Siegel. And you've heard me talk about Dan Siegel in the past, especially if you're already part of this community, because when I did the video a few months back on the hand model, talking about how we flip our lids, that comes from Dr. Dan Siegel. Um, now, the window of tolerance describes the optimal zone of arousal for a person to function in everyday life. So when a person is operating with this, within this zone or window, they can effectively manage and cope with their emotions. So arousal, the word arousal here is referring to an optimal level of balance between sympathetic activation, which is what we call generically fight or flight, and parasympathetic activation, which is associated not entirely or exclusively, but it is associated with the freeze response. And it's also referring to vagus nerve activation, which is more related to dissociation or collapse. And this is coming from a physiological standpoint. Um, so just to explain a little bit about what's behind this window of tolerance um, and to give you an idea of what these terms mean. That's really important to understand. And before I get too far into this, um, I just wanted to welcome anybody new. If this is your first video and you're not part of the community, welcome. It's great to have you here. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit that bell below and subscribe. Um, that way you won't miss anything and you'll quickly realize that my videos all relate to each other. Um, and if you find this valuable, please share it with somebody else, because my whole goal is to get information out into the world for free that can help us understand ourselves better and lead to more compassion and empathy in the world. So let's come back to the window of tolerance. The window of tolerance really is an important concept because it gives us a framework for thinking about how we function best, how our functioning can shift in the various roles that we play in life and how we can manage ourselves better when heightened emotions have a negative impact on us or situations that we might be in. So it really is normal for our emotions to fluctuate throughout the day. And it's also normal not to feel the same way from one day to the next or one situation to the next or moment to moment even. So when times of stress and crisis are coupled with a heightened emotional state, it can become difficult to express verbally what's happening with us on the inside. And those are the moments when we might say and do things that we aren't so proud of later on. And that's why it's important to understand this concept. So the resilient zone, also known as the window of tolerance, is a bit like that paper tray in your printer. Both sides move. And you can narrow or widen your window based on, or that tray in your printer based on the size of paper you're using. And it's very similar with our windows of tolerance. Um, some people have a narrower window of tolerance while others have a much wider one. And they, and they can expand and contract just like that tray in your printer. So... I'm going to circle back in a couple slides to talk about 
some of the things that can impact and affect how wide or narrow our window of tolerance is. But first, let's dive a little bit deeper into the resilient zone so we can understand this concept a little bit better. So the window of tolerance or the resilient zone is a state of well-being in mind, body, and spirit. When a person is in their resilient zone, they can handle life's ups and downs, kind of that wave with relative ease. So if somebody is in their zone, they might be annoyed or even angry, but they don't lose their head. Or a person might feel sad or down in the dumps, but that doesn't mean they're going to be swept away by a river of sorrows because of their emotions. So when somebody is in their resilient zone or their okay zone or within that window of tolerance, they can manage those emotional ups and downs and those fluctuations and still be some version of their best self. So people who are in their resilient zone are also able to recognize when they're close to getting bumped out of their zone. So they realize when they're getting next to those turquoise lines, whether it's that upper edge or that lower edge. And this is what I meant a few weeks ago when I talked in the videos, the three series of videos I did on boundaries, when I said that you really need to know your limits and edges this is what I mean, your limits that will bump you high into that fight or flight or bump you low into that freeze or collapse state. Know what sends you out of your zone and intercede on your own behalf before it happens. That's what boundaries are for. But when you're in your resilient zone, life is like that wave. And so there are times in your day when you're calmer, other times when you're experiencing more stress. So there's this natural ebb and flow. But being in your zone means that you can manage those challenges that you face throughout the day by being your some version of your best self in body, mind, and spirit. And the whole goal of some of the practices that I'm going to share in a few minutes is to help widen your resilient zone so we're not stuck with a narrow one. But let's go on and talk about the signs and symptoms, how we know when we're in our zone, when we're bumped high, and when we're bumped low. So notice the signs and symptoms that you might experience when you're in your window of tolerance or in your resilient zone. You're going to be more responsive. You're going to feel more safe. You're going to have patience and kindness and empathy and compassion. You're going to be adaptable and attentive. You're going to be able to focus and concentrate and think rather quickly. You're going to be in the present moment. You'll feel more open and curious. You'll feel calmer, more relaxed, um, and you'll be a better communicator. But what happens when you get bumped high? And bumped high is the hyper arousal zone. So with hyper arousal, that's more of the fight or flight that we associate with. So some of the symptoms that you might associate with being bumped high include feeling angry or irritated. Um, you're going to feel more edgy or uneasy, impulsive, aggressive, hypervigilant, constricted, intense, your heart rate's going to increase. You're going to be more impulsive. Um, you might even feel scared. You're going to experience more physical pain in your body. You might have anxiety and panic. It's going to be a lot harder to focus and pay attention. And your breathing is not going to be deep breathing. It's not going to be normal. You might even be holding your breath and not realizing realize it or have incredibly shallow breath. So these are some of the signs and symptoms that we associate with being bumped high into that fight or flight state. And other times we can get bumped low into the hypo arousal zone. And hypo arousal is more associated with freeze or dissociation or numbing out that vagus nerve activation state um, and the freeze response in the body. So some of the signs and symptoms that you might experience if you're bumped low include um, maybe problems with memory or even amnesia, trying to remember things. You're going to feel more shut down, dissociated, numb, detached. You might even have confused, fuzzy, foggy thinking. You might feel like you're in a stupor or dizzy. Um, you're more likely to be cold. 
physically. Um, you might feel like you're in a funk, paralyzed, immobile, just utterly exhausted and fatigued. Again, you're not going to have a lot of self-awareness, not going to have as much attention. This might turn into procrastination. And there could be higher levels of shame and isolation if you're bumped low. So it's important to remember, um, before I give some tips about how we can get ourselves back into our zones, I want to talk just for a few minutes about individual differences and what can affect a person's window of tolerance um, and how that can fluctuate um, due to different circumstances um, and, and just different variables. So the first variable that can help determine our window of tolerance is temperament. And temperament is one of those things that really doesn't shift or change all that much. And it can lead to some pretty big differences in how wide or narrow an individual person's window of tolerance actually is. According to the American Psychological Association, temperament is the basic foundation of personality usually assumed to be biologically determined and present early in life. And it includes such characteristics as energy level, emotional responsiveness, demeanor, mood, response tempo, behavioral inhibition, and a willingness to explore. Differences in temperament generally lie along a continuum with shy being at one extreme end at one extreme end of the continuum and bold being at the other extreme end. So differences in temperament generally a lot lie along this shy bold continuum, meaning that regardless of whether you're more shy or more bold, if you get to those extreme ends in your shyness or how bold you are, you're likely to have a narrower window of tolerance. And the more you are toward the center of that continuum, you're going to have a wider window of tolerance and the flexibility to, to navigate back and forth between shyness and boldness. So this is neither good nor bad. And I really want that to stand out. What is important is that you realize or have some sort of concept of where you lie on that shy, bold continuum, and that you're able to adjust and manage accordingly. Life's experiences, especially if we've had trauma or adverse experiences in our background can affect a person's window of tolerance. Individuals who had out of control emotions in childhood without a proper sense of an adult or a guardian or somebody present who could help them calm down, um, they might find that they're a lot less able to self-soothe and they might find that they have a narrow window of tolerance because the likelihood was that they just were surrounded by adults in childhood who weren't able to self-regulate themselves. And we certainly can't teach the people in our lives, especially our children, a skill that we don't know how to do ourselves. So experiential history and trauma history can impact a person's window of tolerance. The good news is this is a lot more changeable and adaptable than temperament. Temperament's harder to adjust and harder to change. Social context can affect a person's window of tolerance. In certain situations, you're going to have more capacity than others. So the presence or absence of people that you feel safe around can impact how wide or narrow your window or your resilient zone is from situation to situation. Physiological states can really affect our window of tolerance. And that can include things like hunger, We've all heard the term hangry. Um, it could include thirst. Maybe you have to go really, really badly. And if that's the case, you're not going to be able to think about a lot else. And that could narrow your window of tolerance. Or you could just be really tired. And there are other physiological states, you know, like maybe your belly's gurgling or whatever. But that can narrow your window of tolerance from moment to moment. A person's state of mind also has an effect. If there are pre-existing levels of stress that aren't managed well, or if there's some adverse experience that you're living through and you're not managing that experience very well, that can really narrow your window of tolerance as well.
but it's not all doom and gloom. So while there are some things, especially like temperament, that aren't likely to shift or change, um, several of these other factors you do have control over and you are able to make adaptations and changes. So let's talk about that. What can you do when you're bumped high into that fight or flight hyper arousal zone? What can you do to get yourself back down into that nice moderate window of tolerance? Well, here are seven simple practices that can help you get back into your own personal okay zone. First of all, 711 breathing. 711 breathing is simply inhaling to a count of seven and exhaling to a count of 11. And that really long exhale can activate the parasympathetic response in the body, which calms the nervous system and it can bring you back to where you have your lid back on and you can access your thinking brain again. Drinking from a straw, this can have an impact on the nervous system because it taps into one of our earliest and evolutionary self-soothing mechanisms, which is suckling. This is why babies suck their thumbs. It's self-soothing or why they do well with pacifiers. Um, taking a brisk walk. Um, marching on the spot or something that gets your body moving, especially if you know that you're jittery and you're experiencing a flight response, exaggerating that flight response as a way to kind of discharge that energy through a brisk walk or maybe even a jog can really be beneficial. Isometric contractions. So let's say you realize you're having a fight response and you're really angry. An isometric contraction where I am right now is simply putting my hands on the desk and pressing into it as hard as I can. And then as I relax after a few seconds of that contraction, I can feel my body start to relax more and more and more. Street squeeze or stress balls. These can be really, really helpful to bring you back into um, a thinking state and to access your thinking brain when you're have a heightened when you're having a heightened emotion. Um, whoops. Music. Um, I do recommend with music to create a playlist for yourself. Um, like on Spotify, for example, you can create a soothing and calming playlist that has nothing on it, but songs that kind of help you relax, calm down and feel more at ease. And finally, five, four, three, two, one. And I put senses here because name it, say it out loud, five things that you see, four things that you feel, three things that you hear, two things that you can smell, one thing that you can taste. And if it doesn't make sense to access your five senses, it can be literally anything. It could be something you're looking forward to, something you're grateful for, something you appreciate. Say it out loud and bring yourself back to yourself. And then finally, what can you do to get from hypo arousal, that low zone, in order to bring yourself back up into that moderate window of tolerance. So again, I've offered seven skills that you can access right away. First of all, anything that stimulates your senses, especially smell. And that's because smell is the fastest way to your thinking brain. So when you're bumped low, if you have a nice smell handy, whether it's a favorite perfume, a scented candle, an essential oil that you can put in your diffuser or some other scent, have that close by. And it could be anything else. It doesn't have to be smell, but smell is the fastest way. A weighted blanket can be really beneficial, especially if you're feeling low, because it can create a sense of feeling of safety and comfort. And the weight also brings that presence back at your a present awareness back into your body. Dance and music again. I encourage you to create a second playlist on Spotify. Um, that this one is going to include music that revs you up, invigorates you, peps you up, makes you feel good or motivated or inspired to get up and do something and to dance. And I encourage you, if you're feeling low, if you have that urge or impulse to move, do it. Bouncing 
on a yoga ball, a trampoline, or a therapy ball can really bring some awareness back into your body because as you bounce or jiggle, you can feel the energy coming back into your body. Chewy or crunchy foods surprisingly can bring you back into your body and it can bring you back up into that state of your okay zone because chewy or crunchy foods is something that can bring your awareness back to yourself and bring that thinking brain back online again. Do something that utilizes your hands. Wash your hands, finger paint, play in sand, do finger tracing. And when I say finger tracing, if you look at the video in the corner, I have this little finger labyrinth and I can use the finger labyrinth that I can just trace my finger along the lines. And it's really quite soothing. So you can Google um, or go to your search engine and print one of these off for yourself because there are plenty of them out there. And finally, same thing I mentioned before, five, four, three, two, one, say it out loud, use your senses, five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can feel, two things you're excited about, and one thing that you're grateful for. It doesn't have to be all your senses. So I hope that you have found this information helpful. I hope you got some good tips about what the window of tolerance is, why that matters, and some great ideas that you can start practicing right away to help get yourself back into your zone when you realized you're bumped high or when you realized you're bumped low. Um, if you want to learn more about this, like I said, I am a certified trainer for the community resiliency model. All you have to do is reach out to me, um, look me up go to my website, follow the links here in the letter because I teach this workshop um, and I do teach it by request. I could teach it to as little as one person or as many as 20 um, or more. Uh, it's adaptable. Um, it can be adapted to the time frame that you have accessible, whether that's two hours or two and a half days. Um, it depends on how much information you want, how many skills you want, and how much science-backed information you want presented. So feel free to reach out if you're interested in this particular workshop. All right. I hope you found val value in this information, everyone. Um, feel free to like, share, subscribe, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Happy self-discovery, everyone.